This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas this past week, and I'd like to wish you all a very Happy New Year as we go into 2019. And we do so with one of my favorite guests, uh, the great economist Daniel Lacaye. Many of you know him uh, as someone who's been on the show before. He's been sort of back and forth between London and his home of Madrid over the past few years, and very active on all the Talking Head shows, but may, perhaps more importantly for our purposes, author of a great book called Escape from the Central Bank Trap. Daniel, great to see you. Great to talk to you as well. Always a, always a pleasure. Well, I, I have to start with this dog and pony show of a week or so ago when Jerome Powell made his dreary announcement that we're going to have another quarter point interest rate hike. I, what kind of economy is so terrified of, of two and a half or three percent interest rates? It seems absurd to me. It is. It is completely absurd. And it shows what what type of bubble we live in, that an economy with uh, almost 3% uh, unemployment, 3% uh, inflation is not going to take uh, a rate hike of 25 basic points. It sounds absurd. It is completely absurd. If you think about it from the real economy perspective, because we're talking about uh, a rate hike that has very little sort of uh, effect in the real economy, in the investment decisions, in everything that should be, you know, a really strong economy, you know, and, and to think that there are people out there sort of uh, implying that, that that's such a completely tiny, minuscule uh, rate hike, more importantly, announced, I don't even want to know how many times. I don't even want to know, I uh, want to remember how many times have they said that rate hikes are going to follow this path, announcing it over and over and over again, precisely for the real economy to get used to it. But, ah, here's the problem, is that the financial asset-led economy is very much based on one single trade, which is the Fed will not do what they said they would do. And as such, we have the tantrum that we have seen in the markets. But, but uh, the economy can, should, and must take uh, a rate hike that, by the way, continues to place the Fed below the curve. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Austrians get a lot of heat sometimes for uh, their obsession with central banking. Do you think we put too much into central bank that it has a smaller effect on the economy than we imagine? No, we. I think we 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 rightly place uh, the blame and the uh, and you know and the, and, the, and the headline and the, and the, uh, and the impact of the central bank is enormous. The impact of the central banks is enormous because at the end of the day, in the in the last 10 years, what we have seen is unprecedented. We have seen an unprecedented increase in money supply and unprecedented monetary stimulus. We have never seen anything like what we have seen with all central banks almost uh, at in tandem, raising their balance sheet to above 20% of GDP in the case of the United States, but 100% of GDP, 40% of GDP in the case of uh, of the of the eurozone, uh, and at the same time, massively uh, distorting the price of money. So at the end of the day, obviously, we 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 are we are doing the right thing, which is which is to show that the the one single factor that has the biggest impact on the economy is a central bank that is distorting the amount and uh, and the price of money you think jerome powell is is well read do you think he would accept the, the broad parameters of business cycle that that banks are too expansionary uh, malinvestment occurs as a result and and then there's a bust later do you think he'd accept that just conceptually uh, to a certain extent, yes. I don't think that he sees it from the perspective that we see it. I've had the pleasure of uh, speaking with him, and uh, I don't think that he sees it from the perspective that we see it of incentivizing malinvestment uh, mm -hmm. by lowering interest rates to unsustainable levels. And I don't think that he sees it either from the perspective of banks 
uh, having a perverse incentive to to create these bubbles that we talk about. But I do think that he does understand that there is a point in which further stimulus is not going to help the economy, rather it's going to harm the economy. And I think that he understands that uh, that if the if he believes in cent- in the central bank as a factor that sort of smooths out uh, economic cycles if interest rates are not hiked right now and uh, the quantity on the balance sheet of the of the central bank is not reduced uh, right now then it is going to create a much larger and very important problem once the cycle truly changes so you mentioned the the extraordinary monetary policy of the last 10 years does that mean we'll never see 10 or 15 percent fed's fund rate again in the in the u.s like we saw in the 70s are those days simply over in america i think that they are I think that they are over. I mean, obviously, never. I, I wouldn't dare to say never, as uh, Janet Yellen said, that we would never see a crisis in uh, in our lifetime. Um, but it's very difficult that we see interest rates of 10, 15 percent, because it's also extremely difficult that in, a, that in a globalized economy in which the level of debt is is as high as it is right now and will likely continue to rise, it is very unlikely that we will see the levels of inflation that those 10, 15% rates uh, implied mm-hmm. as well. No? So it's okay. very, very unlikely. We have to understand that technology, uh, high debt, many of these factors basically erode inflationary pressures. And um, some of, the, of those factors are truly are fantastic, like globalization, like uh, uh, the improvement in, in, in worldwide commerce, mm-hmm. the uh, increase of technology, efficiency, all those factors are very positive. Obviously, unfortunately, the massive increase in debt is not uh, a positive, but all of those factors are disinflationary. So it is very unlikely that uh, we will see the levels of inflation that we saw in those in those years, and with that, that uh, that price that price of money, those interest rates. But if we look at the West, we look at this huge increase in debt. We have we have sovereign debt exploding. We have corporate debt exploding. Personal and household debt, mortgages, credit cards, student loans. The amount of debt today versus two thousand eight. The last crisis yeah. is, is, is almost unfathomable. So doesn't this mean that raising interest rates is today for, by central bankers is very different than raising them 30 or 40 or 50 years ago? It is. It's a different animal today. It is a completely different animal. Absolutely, it is. But that is precisely why uh, communication and the way in which interest rates are set is so important. From the, uh, I'm, I'm placing myself in the, in the position of how central banks think. It is so important that they constantly uh, give guidance about what the rate hike path will be mm-hmm. and that they adhere to it. Because when they don't is when you create the, the massive uh, perverse incentives that uh, lead to bubbles. If you say, I'm going to uh, increase rates next year two times, you don't increase them, then mm, there's, a, there's a massive buy uh, the junk type of uh, and, and, and get, more, get more into more debt type of, uh, type of situation. Uh, I think that what happens is that On one side, you want to have interest rates that disincentivize the malinvestment that we were talking about before and that prevent the creation of large bubbles. But at the same time, you want uh, interest rates that are low enough for governments to uh, sort of absorb this kind of debt. And it's, it's it's an impossible scenario to contemplate. You cannot have interest rates that are low enough for governments, which are the first recipients of money and obviously the ones more incentivized to increase debt because they don't suffer any of the negatives of, of, of increasing debt, and at the same time prevent the creation of bubbles and the creation of mm-hmm. large uh, financial asset imbalances. Well, here's a point I'd like to make, which is at least speaking to America, 
there are still poor people in America who might go into a rental center to rent some furniture or a TV or might obtain a credit card. They're still paying 22% interest on these things. In other words, ultra low interest rates haven't necessarily helped people at the very bottom much at all. In, low interest rates never help people at the bottom because low interest rates and high liquidity always benefit the ones that are already indebted mm -hmm. and that are the first recipients of money. Therefore, governments, the very wealthy and the uh, extremely uh, high intensive asset wealth no? mm -hmm. uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. So obviously, the, the who suffers from, from money creation and from uh, 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 very low interest rates? Savers and salaries. Uh, the, 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 and as you very well say, the poor, uh, if they have to use a credit card to, uh, to finance some of their purchases, they're going to be paying 22%. Who pays 2.5%? Uh, the extremely indebted. And the government. That's that's basically basically the it's it because so that's why, funnily enough, these uh, monetary policies that are allegedly made to uh, sort of uh, help redistribution of wealth. What they create is actually more inequality because the 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 sectors that are not that do not access debt and do not access uh, stock markets or, or, or financial assets, those are not just not benefited. They are the ones that are actually suffering from it because they see the inflation that we believe is low, but is high for them. No? And they see that the, that the cost of uh, borrowing a little bit for tiny purchases mm -hmm. is actually very, very high. Well, you talk a lot about the effects of QE, both in the US and in Europe. I, I'd like to touch on that. Uh, first of all, your argument is not that all the growth in the US since the crisis of 2008 in, in equity markets, in housing, in jobs, in consumer confidence, et cetera. You would not argue that all of that has been artificial mm. and, and purely, uh, purely a result of Fed stimulus. You, you would argue there is some organic growth in the United States economy. Yeah, there is. There is obviously the, the the U.S. economy is is completely different to the Japanese or the or the European one because the real economy is not is is barely financed by the financial system by the banks. So it's about twenty percent of the real economy is is financed by by the banks, and as such, artificial money creation does obviously. Uh, lead to pockets of bubbles here and there, but but it's a much more dynamic and much more real economy than uh, e economies that are sort of very clustered around government spending, like the Japanese or the or the eurozone one. Now, is part of that just because the United U.S. economy is so vast? In, in size and scope, when you say only about 20% of it is directly financed by banks, you know, just explain a little bit more what you mean. And does that help us understand why QE hasn't led to, to huge CPI increases? Yeah, well, if you think about the, the real economy, when the real economy is extremely dependent on bank financing, very large changes in interest rates and in money supply coming from central banks create a, a very quick domino effect into the economy. Why? Because banks basically are uh, penalized for holding assets and they are incentivized to lend almost at any cost. This is what happened in the stimulus of the Eurozone of 2008. This is what happened. Actually, the Eurozone has been a chain of stimuli uh, uh, since its creation. But in the case of the of the United States, it is true that there is a, a very large sort of financial asset based economy. But the real economy is mostly financed by via equity. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about the debt of the S&P 500 companies. We talk a lot about the debt of the large companies that are quoted. But that is a very actually it's a very small proportion mm. of the economy. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because it's very large, it's because it is very independent from uh, from government, the, 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 the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, uh, the, mm, small and medium enterprises, the, the, uh, the households, etc., depend very, very little 
on government spending. Uh, the obviously the, the the public sector workforce is is significantly lower than in than in the eurozone or in other uh, 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 in the eurozone countries, for example. So it's much more it's a much more dynamic economy, and it is also an economy in which um, there is a very quick process of uh, penalization of mistakes that is uh, that that creates that uh, the, the positive effect of creative destruction so yes you do get pockets of bubbles you get the tech bubble those companies go bust suddenly hey you have this massive investment that has already happened and you have other companies that take over and that mm, uh, generate higher returns that's why is it is an an economy an economy that tends to avoid the risk of zombification that economies in which, that depend too much on the on the sort of circle of uh, government and crony sector uh, type of let's say base depends now so if you look at for example the from 2000 uh, in the crisis of 2008 one of the reasons why the why the US economy recovered very very quickly uh, was because you had a very quick process of creative destruction. You had, yes, you had numerous bankruptcies, you had foreclosures, you had all those things, but quickly you have people buying those assets, people restructuring those 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 companies, people uh, making big, big uh, changes into that. You don't have sort of a subsidy system that would zombify the incompetitive sectors. Uh, you do have it in some parts in the United States economy, but it is much, much more dynamic and much more, let's say, uh, price and profit driven. This is the key. The key is that the US is a profit driven economy. Whilst that is not the case of Japan or, uh, or the Eurozone, for example. Well, you point out that Europe is actually not doing nearly as well as I think a lot of Americans might believe. So ECB QE has not been a, a resounding success. I was I was interested where you point out uh, not only is government spending as a percentage of GDP up, but I didn't realize that unemployment in Europe, in the Eurozone, is maybe twice that of the United States. Yeah. So why 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 isn't this seen as a refutation of QE? I find it very interesting. I think that there is... You know what happens, you know, when you travel a lot, like I have the, the, the great opportunity to do, is that you see how when you travel to the United States, most people have a very negative perception of what is happening in the United States. Why? Because everything that you read every day uh, is, is negative. Uh, and you think that everybody else is doing phenomenally in the, in the Eurozone, no? And obviously, if, when you travel, you tend to travel on holidays and on holidays, you know, beautiful cities, lovely restaurants, great, great, you know, great things. But at the end of the day, when you're thinking about the economy, the 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 reality of the eurozone is is very very challenging because we took yes, first the eurozone unemployment is double, uh, not only the United States rate, but also the Japan and other comparable economies uh, rate. So that it, that is a very a very big problem. Youth unemployment is also a dramatic problem in the eurozone, um, because it has a system that is allegedly uh, a protection system that doesn't protect, that basically just keeps a very high level of unemployment. And this is not a fixture that has always been that way. Uh, Olivier Blanchard and many other economists have pointed out how the Eurozone, the, the, the European Union and the United States had very similar rates of unemployment uh, about 20, 25 years ago. It's just moved dramatically, dramatically in different uh, directions uh, since the implementation of, the, of this directed economy and it's very easy for some economists to blame it on the euro or to blame it on the currency oh it's because of the currency they can't print money and therefore they if, if countries cannot print money well it didn't work either before it didn't work for italy or for spain before when they had their own their own currencies so, so unemployment is a very big problem the other big problem is how quickly industrial production credit growth uh, direct financial investment, 
uh, uh, imp- uh, hiring decisions, consumer confidence deteriorate after the stimulus uh, has happened. It's, it's been staggering to see how quickly uh, con- uh, even the, the allegedly strongest economy of the Eurozone, Germany, how quickly it has deteriorated in 2018. But the case of France, which has never had any austerity, uh, is is also quite quite staggering, and and it's not because of the monetary policy. It is not because of the of the uh, uh, not being able to print uh, the currency by each of the countries. It is because it has implemented a completely directed economy model uh, copied from the French. Do you think we'll ever see a day where there aren't sovereign bonds among Eurozone countries that they'll just be Euro bonds? In other words, to have a single currency, but to have all of these countries still issuing their own debt seems unsustainable long term. It is to a certain point unsustainable, but it is very difficult to, to, you have to change the structure of the Eurozone in order to have Euro bonds. You cannot have Euro bonds when you don't have credit responsibility. Because if you had, if you have euro bonds today, uh, in essence, what what I don't know, France or Italy or Spain or Portugal or Greece will would be doing would be to issue a lot of debt underwritten by Germany, hmm. uh, and you know, think about it from the perspective of the United States. The reason why the United States has a fiscal union and has the ability to uh, to sort of have that 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 system is because at least so far there is credit responsibility. So when California goes ba- bankrupt, it doesn't get bailed out by I don't know Illinois Texas or by or by <laughs> Texas. No, uh, although the Texans believe that they do, but it's not true. Um, so the the. The problem of the eurozone is that it's a system that that from the fiscal perspective it is based on credit irresponsibility. So you you get penalized if you do well. Hmm? If you do well, uh, the ECB is going to buy less bonds from you. If you do well, your uh, your your savings are going to be used to finance the um, excess spending of other countries. So it becomes. It is a fiscal system that is the equivalent of a classroom in which you get penalized if you get a uh, if you get A's. No, so you you have the, all the incentives to have lots of D's and and be and be bailed out, and that is so you cannot have euro bonds in that environment. You need to have some level of fiscal responsibility that is. That is not based on, oh, yes, we have a deficit target of 2%. Whoops, it went to 4 Guess what? No problem. Um, you have to have some level of real credit responsibility. That is very, very difficult in a Eurozone in which the main uh, target, the main objective of all of the governments is to avoid the pain. And avoid the pain means that uh, you cannot, pe- you don't penalize the ones that do uh, things very incorrectly, and you don't reward the ones that do uh, very well. Well, Daniel, final question for you: We we live in the world we live in. Central banks are as they are. If you could sit down and advise people at the Fed or the ECB today, what would be your real world advice to you know, given the situation we're in today? I think that the, my real world advice would be to say first, you need to stop looking only at CPI at, uh, uh, for consumer price index for, uh, for your analysis of what monetary policy is doing. You need to look at financial assets. You need to pay attention to financial assets because financial assets lead the bubble, but the burst of financial assets hurts the real economy. So you need to look at that and you need to really, from a serious perspective, look at whether valuations are aggressively uh, heated or... Uh, so that that is one of the key factors that I would say. The other is that, you know, central banks only rely on one thing, which is faith. If they lose the confidence 
of citizens, and they're very close, and they are extremely close to that, then it's going to be a big, big, big disaster. So what they want is to um, sort of continue to be moderators of liquidity and improvements in the economy, etc. What they definitely need to do is three things. One is that they need to be data dependent. That they need to, to they need to say, look, this is the way in which we will set rates. This is the way in which is going to be in which liquidity is going to be injected, and it's going to be based on these parameters, so that me or any other financial investor doesn't go out and say, ha ha ha, opportunity to buy the junk. So that is one. So data dependent. The second is communication. Do what you say. If you don't do what you say you create the perverse incentive that you're seeing in the eurozone that you're seeing in so many countries in which countries in which governments in the eurozone are saying no we don't care that the ecb is is not going to buy bonds anymore because we're going to continue spending they will have to buy them so do what you say you do because if you don't you will you are basically uh, generating the, the the next crisis the third and I think that is an important factor is you cannot just look at CPI you cannot and, and uh, unemployment. You need to add other factors. And other factors that are extremely important here is not just credit growth per se, money supply growth, but quality of that credit growth. So they need to go, they need to be more uh, detailed, for example, about analyzing what type of credit growth is happening in uh, in the economies that they are sort of directing. Um, think about this, for, for example, when I visited the ECB recently, uh, I, I, I told them that one of the things that worried me was that 80% of investment uh, growth in the Eurozone, of investment growth, okay, uh, was recycling of capital. Guess what? Very few first knew that that, that 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 piece of information. Secondly, very few thought of that as a problem. It is a problem because it's part of this uh, massive illusion of multiple expansion. No? So those three factors, I think, would be very important. I think that there's a, you know, I'm not going to defend it, but the, I, I sort of understand the new school of Fisher, Irving Fisher followers, that basically believe that it is interest rates going higher what will actually drive better and stronger growth and uh, better growth of of of, uh, of capital expenditure uh, instead of low rates and high liquidity. But uh, you know those three factors: uh, pay attention to financial assets, communication, do what you say. Third pay a lot of attention about the quality of credit growth. Well, Daniel, that's all really fascinating stuff. We'll see what Powell does. He he's certainly claims to be data-driven. So far, he's stuck to his guns on these interest rate hikes. We'll see. But but what I like about him is, is he's by all accounts, you know, not a wonk. He's not a PhD academic. He's a, he's a lawyer. And, and we're going to see just how data-driven he is. That said, Daniel, thanks for your time, ladies and gentlemen. The easiest way to follow Daniel and his work and, and catch up on uh, you know, his appearances on the Talking Head shows is via Twitter on his Twitter feed. Uh, it is at DLaCaye underscore IA. And uh, Daniel, we thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great New Year's Eve. Thank you so much. Happy New Year to everyone, and thanks for having me. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.